Welcome to the Known Victory Church YouTube channel. We are so glad that you found us today. We exist to make Jesus known and to be a place that anyone can call home. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, like, and share these messages so we can truly make Jesus known in our homes, cities, and across the world. We pray that this message impacts you and helps you to grow closer to Jesus. If you're new, you don't know me. My name is Dustin. I'm the lead pastor here at Known Victory Church. It's an honor to have you uh, with us uh, in uh, this house today. And we started a series last week. And in this series we started, it was called Built to Last. And we were, talk, were talking about what it takes or what it means to actually build our life on the right things, to build our life on Jesus, as well as we're talking about building the church, which I believe as followers of Jesus, really part of our responsibility is to build the church. That uh, Jesus, when he's talking to Peter, says, I, I, I will build my church and, the, and the gates of hell will not prevail, right? He, he's saying the church will be built. It's going to build. And I love that God asks you and I to be a part of, of this journey, that God asks you and I to be a part of, uh, uh, of his church and a part of building his church. And I I think it's such an honor that we get to do this. And I think that we have to remember that God is building his church. And the church, that church, you know, Sunday morning is not supposed to be a thing in our schedule. That church isn't just supposed to be an hour or two hours on Sunday morning. Church is not supposed to just happen on the weekend. Church is supposed to happen everywhere we go. That we carry the church, we carry community, we carry Jesus with us wherever we go. It's about being a community of people serving and giving and taking care of each other and stirring each other on to love and good works. And God is building his church. And I'm so excited again that we, you and I, get to be a part of it. And this is the, you know, the church, the bride of Christ that he loves. And so we ought to love the church as well. And for me, I've dedicated most of my life to the church. To, to building his kingdom, to building the gospel, to sharing Jesus. And I love the church. You know, I don't, I'm not just talking about, you know, known victory. I'm talking like I love the church. I love hearing stories from all over the world of what God is doing in other nations. I love hearing stories of what, of what God is doing in other churches here in our city. You know, our, our, our city is filled with incredible churches that God is moving in. That even when we gather on Sunday mornings, you know, at 10 a.m., we're not the only ones in our city. Thousands of people across our city come together Sunday morning to worship Jesus. And I think we need to understand that, that, that the church is not just here, but it's everywhere we go. And I think we need to realize how powerful and big the church actually is. That God is actually moving across our city and across our nation. God is on the move. And I think that for me, you know, I don't want to miss out on what God is doing because of whatever it might be. But God is building his church. So let us not lose hope. Let us not lose faith that God is doing what he said he was going to do. And one thing that you might know about me by now, and if you knew, you might not know this. I am in no uh, means a handyman. Um, I think... Beth is the handyman of our house. Um, she's always the one fixing stuff. She's always the one, you know, she's like, she mows our lawn. Like, she, she, that's just, she, she does it all. I just, I'm allergic to grass. I, 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 like, our neighbors will mow our lawn, and I can, like, and the only reason I know is because I, I feel it in my nose. You know what I mean? Like, I can tell when someone mows their lawn by how my nose feels. I might not even hear the mower. I might not even see it, but I know it's happening. And I'm not a handyman. When I was in, in high school, um, our football coach, he was like, hey, we need to build a deck out front of our clubhouse, our field house, we call it, where we would, you know, get, have all our pads and stuff. He's like, we need to build a deck. Why he asked, like, five 15, 16-year-old boys to come help him build the deck, I do not know. So what happened is he gave us the measurement for the pieces, and he said, make sure you cut them exactly this length. And we're like, no problem, right? Like, easy. But to be honest, by the end of the deck, it looked more like a xylophone than a deck. Somehow, it's, the deck kept getting shorter and shorter as it moved along. And eventually he comes up. He wasn't even watching us do it, right? Like, the trust this man had for us was unbelievable. And he probably shouldn't have, but he comes in like, what are you guys doing? You're wasting the wood. And we're like, we did what we thought you asked us to do. Like, we were building this deck, and it did not go very well. Why? Because building actually can be hard. 
Those of us who have built things before, maybe you work in carpentry, you work with wood or whatever it is, you build things, being off just slightly can make a massive impact on the product you're about to create. And every single detail is very important. And there's a story in the Bible of this guy named Nehemiah, and he's tasked with building a wall. And we're going to be reading uh, through this story a bit today. We're going to kind of read the whole story, but we're going to pick kind of pieces from the story and kind of give us an understanding of what was happening. And Nehemiah, if you don't know, he was the cupbearer for the king, and it was a big job, right? Because it's like, you take it, and if it kills you, then I know I'm not going to drink that, right? Like, that's his job. Nehemiah. And oftentimes he would take sips again to, to drink to make sure the king wouldn't die. It's a, it's a tough job he had. And he's working one day and he hears word that the wall around the city of his people was burned to the ground and is in ruins. He hears that the wall around his city is gone. The thing that was supposed to protect his people and his family, it's gone. The thing that he thought was there is gone. Like this, this wall is completely gone, burned to the ground and in ruins. There's no protection or mo- no real hope for his people. They were super vulnerable to attack. And he, 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 he has this moment of kind of where he breaks down and he doesn't know what to do. And he starts praying. Then one day he sees the king. The king sees that he's struggling and asks him what's wrong. He's like, what's going on? Like, I can tell something's wrong. Like, like the way you sipped my wine today was weird. Are you okay? I don't know how it happened, okay? I wasn't there, but that's how I picture it. He's like, why are you so sad drinking my wine? He's like, well, I might die, right? I don't know. But he asks the kings. uh, He starts praying. He talks to the king, and he realizes he's struggling, and he shares his deep concern, and he gets permission to go and look at the wall. He says, hey, can I go away for a, few, for a bit? I want to go take a look at the wall to see what it actually looks like, to see how big of a problem this actually is. And in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 17, it says this. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in. This is after he's seen the wall in shambles. How Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. And he says this, come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer. Derision. And I told them of the hand of my God that that had been upon me for good and also of the works that the king had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. Now just this verse, there's like verses, there's so many things that we could pull out of this. Just this one verse. But what I've taught, what I've called my message today is rebuilding together. And I have four uh, thoughts today when it comes to what it takes to rebuild. What, what does it take for us to actually rebuild? And then one, the first thought I have, it comes right from this verse, is don't do it alone. Don't do it alone. See, see, Nehemiah, he says this. He says, come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may long, longer suffer. Come, let us build together. See, he goes to the wall, realizes it's in shambles. And how many times in our own lives do we look around us and we see the life that we thought we would have and we see the things that we thought we would be and we, we look around and we actually see all we might see is brokenness. The things that we had up, that, the, 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 the things that would protect us or whatever, we, we kind of let them go down and now we're, being, we're super vulnerable to attack. So when we look around, we see brokenness and loss. See, I think the reality is, is that on our own, the, the problem, what we're trying to rebuild, whether it's the church or whether it's in our life, we can't do it by ourselves. I think in, in culture, and we talk about this so much, but I think because in culture, we like to do things on our own. We see the brokenness, you and I could have gone to the wall and thought, wow, that's a big job. It's not even possible and went home. He said, because Nehemiah couldn't do it by himself. The, the problem was too big. The, the, the devastation was so much that he looked at it and said, no, I can't do this by myself. But if I get people to come and build with me, then we can actually see it happen. We can actually see this wall that once protected our city actually be built again. That together they could rebuild the wall. The things in our lives that, that, that are so broken down. You might not be able to fix it on your own. You might not be able to overcome the addiction in your life by yourself. 
We may not be able to do it alone, yet we try over and over and over again, and we fail over and over and over again, and we're asking God, why? It's like, bring somebody else to help you. Gather the saints, get people to come and help you fix that, help you rebuild the wall in your life, to rebuild those things. And it's the same when it comes to the church. That it's, it's all of us as followers of Jesus building the church along with him. To come together as a family, as a body, to build together what God is trying to do and wants to do in our lives and in our cities. See, this is what Nehemiah saw in Nehemiah 2.13. I went out by night by the valley gate to the dragon spring and to the dung gate, and I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down, and its gates had been destroyed with fire. This is what Nehemiah sees. Again, I think sometimes when we look in our old lives, we always see the devastation. But he sees the brokenness and thought, I can't do this alone. And I think a lot of us, we think we can rebuild the most broken parts of our soul by ourselves. Some of us even think, I can build his church by myself. And it's like, we can't do it alone. And when I worked at, I worked at Canadian Tire. It was my first job I ever had. And a lot of the boxes, they would say, two-man lift. You ever seen that? Two-man lift. Now, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm a football player. I'm 18. I'm 17, 18. I'm like, two-man lift. Yeah, right. So I'm, I'm not joking you. I'm like carrying, <laughs> I'm like literally carrying, um, uh, what do you cook, burgers on barbecues is one of the word I'm looking for. <laughs> like where, what do you barbecue on? <laughs> I'm literally carrying these barbecues out to customers. It says two-man lift and my manager's like, you better not do that, right? And I'm like, watch me. You're going to fire me, you know? But there's this one time I was in, in Calgary and I was tasked with getting a couch upstairs but, or downstairs, but I totally forgot about this until my entire team had left. So just me at like 11.30 p.m. looking at a couch that has to go downstairs by the end of the night. Now, I could have called somebody to live close, but I was like, nah, I can do it by myself. And I'm telling you, I wrecked the couch, like badly. Like it wasn't like, a, like it's usable, it was like probably garbage. See, in life, we think we can do things alone. And to be honest, maybe you can do some of it by yourself. But sometimes doing it alone actually leads to more harm than actually bringing somebody else to be along the side of the journey with you. We all need people in our life to help us. We were not created to do life alone. And this very famous verse in Ecclesiastes 4 says this in verse 9, two are better than one. Because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. Together we're stronger than we are by ourselves. That we, we, I think it's not an accident that the church is, a, is, is more than just one person. It's, it's about Jesus and, and, and all of us coming alongside and following wherever he goes and listening to the words he teaches us in scripture and understanding who Jesus was. But the truth is about life, and if we all know this, not everyone will be for you. Have you noticed that? If you haven't noticed that not everyone will be for you, you're going to notice it maybe soon. Try and do something and someone's like, yeah, that's a horrible idea. Like, that's going to fail. And then you succeed and they're like, I told you so. You're like, no, you didn't. You told me I was going to fail. You know, some people will support us and some people will doubt us. But we need to build a community around those who will lift us up, not those who will push us down. So the question is, who do you have in your life that's fighting for you today? I'm not talking about who did you have in your life five years ago who's fighting for you. I'm not talking about the kid in high school. You guys are buddies. I'm talking about today. Who do you have? Do you have somebody in your life who is fighting for you and fighting with you and building with you? Do you have somebody? And then in Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 19 says this, but when Sanballat the, the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite, a uh, servant of Geshem the Arab, heard of it, they jeered at us and they despised us and said, what is this thing you are doing? 
are you rebelling against the king? Right? People, they thought, hey, they hear what's going on. Like, they, they, they hear, hey, someone's rebuilding the wall. They're like, are you trying to defy the king? You're not supposed to be doing this. What is it that even you are doing? And, and if a couple of chapters later in Nehemiah 4, verse 1 says this. Now, Sanballat heard that they were building the wall, and he was angry and greatly enraged. And he jeered at the Jews. And he said, in the presence of his brothers in the army of Samaria, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish and burn ones at that? Abiah the Ammonite was beside them and he said, yes, what they are building, if a fox goes up, in it, it will break down their stone wall. You know, as they're building, they're hearing over and over again, what you're doing is not possible. What you're doing is pointless. What you're doing doesn't make sense. Why are you wasting your time? Why are you wasting your energy? If a little fox comes and jumps on your wall, it's going to fall down. Guess what we can do because we're stronger than a fox. Like, this is the words they're hearing over and over and over and over again. The next thing that, that, that we need to understand about rebuilding the broken parts of our soul and building the church is that there will be doubters who come. People who don't understand. People who doubt you. People who will doubt the church. People who will doubt your ability, who will doubt your calling, who will doubt your future, who will doubt you will get healthy, who doubt you will find freedom, who doubt that you'll keep, that you'll keep on fighting. They'll doubt your intention and they'll doubt your heart and they'll start to doubt your God. I think we know that there's people around this who say things like this, and we start to believe it. But I think one of the biggest problems that we can have as followers of Jesus is that when we become the doubters, when we're the ones who start to doubt that God is actually moving, when we're the ones who start to doubt that we actually can conquer that thing in our life, we can't be doubters. So many times in, in, when, in Jesus, when he's teaching, so much of it is about faith and let your faith rise up. Faith like a mustard seed. I think so many of us as followers of Jesus, we're almost crippled with the, re, with the thought and doubt starts to creep in and doubt actually becomes more important than our faith. Let us not be doubters. We have to be people of confidence, people of faith, filled with hope and be an encourager to one another. And how can we be confident? How can we be filled with faith? Why? Because of who we serve. Because of what we've seen him do. What have you seen God do in your life recently? We have to stop doubting and start believing that God is going to do the things he promised us. Even if the promise came 20 years ago. And the life you're living now is so far away from where you wish it was. Your life is so far away from where God called you to be. It's not too late to turn back and start to believe and walk in faith that that promise is going to actually take place in your life. How many promises have we let go of? Because it took too long. Be faithful. And don't doubt. You know, the other day, Jane got a new book. And I don't know if you, if, if you know this book. You probably do. It's like over 100 years old. It's called The Little Engine That Could. You know this story? Now, I was, when I read this story, like, I had known it. But, like, when I read it to Jane, it was fascinating to me. Because I kept seeing so, many, so much in it that just kept, like, in my own mind being like, man, like, like, this is important for humanity. Like, it was like this weird thing. And I'm like, I've seen this. And I didn't really know the full story of this book, but the earliest publication of this story appeared in April 8th, 1906. In the New York Tribune as part of a sermon by Reverend Charles S. Wing, the story of the little engine that could. I didn't know this. Maybe you knew this. And, and, and that, when I th read that, I thought that. I was like, man, like, like I, I, I get it. Like, I, I get how important this is. And if you don't know this story, it's a story of this very heavy train that needs to make it over a mountain. They're looking for an engine that would be able to be capable of carrying this train over the mountain, right? 
And so they start looking for an engine that can do it, and they find this big engine. He's powerful and strong, but he says, I, I'm a, uh, that's a very heavy train. Like, I can't, I'm not, I can't do that. It's too heavy. And then they find a, another engine. He's just old, and he's tired, and he says, I can't do it. I'm too tired. I'm too weary. I can't do it. I'm tired. And they find this other engine that carries people and food cars and, and carries people. And he goes, I already did my job. I'm not going to carry this lowly train. I was carrying people. <clears throat> and then they find this small engine. And they ask the same question, will you bring this train over the mountain, right? Maybe you know the story. And the engine, of course, says, I think I can. And as the journey went on, it kept saying that. I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. And slowly creeping up to the top of the mountain, saying it over and over and over again. And once it made it to the top, it made its triumphant descent down the mountain saying, I thought I could, I thought I could. You know, when I read this story, and like, again, I'm reading it to my child, and it's like, in my mind is just like, I'm feeling this kind of weight for humanity and weight for our church of, I think God is more so looking for people who are willing those who are willing to push past the doubters. Now, I'm not saying accolades and experience is bad because those are amazing. But how many times you know the people with the accolades and experience aren't willing? God is looking for hearts who are willing to go. Those who think, yeah, I can do it, and then they go and do it. I think that's who God is looking for. I think sometimes we feel in our life that the only way God will use us is if we've made it or if we got the right education and we got it all. That's not true. Yes, those things will help you. Of course they will. <clears throat> but we don't have to go to him perfect. We go to him in our broken state most of the time and then he starts to rebuild us and reshape us and, and forge us into who we were created to be from the beginning. That's what I truly believe. Those who are willing. How often are the heroes in life so unlikely? You hear stories of athletes who didn't even get drafted and then they end up being some of the best players in the, in the history of a sport. You read through the Bible, the Old Testament, how many of these heroes we read about had a lot of their own personal struggles they went through. So I think in our own lives, Let's stop proving people, uh, pr 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 whoa. I have a, I have a, sometimes I have a problem speaking, okay? But it's true, especially when I'm tired, okay? But I think for us, let's prove people wrong. Let's prove how good our God is. That in the midst of chaos, we can stand strong. That in the midst of pain, we can stand there and still praise. You know how hard that is? It's hard. And I think we've all gone through moments like that. But that's a testimony. That our story of what God's done in our life has the power to change a doubting heart to a faithful heart. Let's be faithful people. And if we continue on in the story of Nehemiah 4, 16 to 18, from that day on, half of my servants worked on construction and half held the spears, shields, bows, and coats of mail. And the leaders stood behind the whole house of Judah who were building the wall. Those who carried burdens were load, loaded in such a way that each labored on the work with one hand and held a weapon with the other. And each of the builders had a sword strapped at his side while he built. The man who sounded the trumpet was beside me. There's so much detail in this, but the next thought I have when it comes to rebuilding, building, is it takes work. And we talked about this last week too. It's gonna be a common theme. Building is not easy. And so what I did today is I, I have a sword, okay? Now I'm gonna explain this sword to you, this sword here. Now, when I, when I, when I walked through the foyer with this earlier, people were staring at me like I was, I was uh, lost my mind. But this story here, this was a gift that I got when I transitioned from my church in Calgary. I was a youth and young adults pastor there for seven years. And then when we moved up here, this was the gift they gave me. It's this sword. Now, this is like, it's not light, okay? Like, it's like, like it's not plastic. It's like metal in a sword. It's not sharp either, though, okay? Like, but I can imagine, you, you, you picture it with me. 
that part of your, like imagine you're a construction worker and you show up to work, you have a sword like this strapped to your side. You're kicked off the site. Right? Like that's like not going to go good for your FLHA, right? Like it's a, that's a hazard on the workplace. So they go to the wall and they have their weapon alongside of them. Now I only have two hands, but I also have this, this axe hammer, okay? Now this is more dangerous than my sword, okay? But imagine you, you're, you're going to build even in your own life and you have part of your, 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 your journey is a thing that's going to be used to work as well as a thing that's going to be used to, to, to fight. I didn't really think about this very deeply because I only have two hands. But this feels better to hold in my hand, okay? But they, they go to build the wall. Do you know what they know? Is that it's, it's going to not just be work, it's going to be a fight at the exact same time. Like imagine you're at a work site, someone's hammering away here, while right behind you, a guy's literally fighting a guy with swords. It's like, are, am I, I going to do good work? You know what I mean? Like I'm a little nervous. What if someone throws an axe at me, right? Like for real, like what if, like imagine this moment where they're, where they're literally fighting and building at the exact same time and they know that going into it, they might not make it out alive. They go to work every day being like, I don't know if this is gonna work, but why am I doing this? To protect my city, to protect my family, to bring protection and bring saving to the people that I love the most. And I think it's almost in my own mind, a parallel to the church and the gospel and Jesus, that it's gonna be hard sometimes when we're praying for our children and they still keep turning away from Jesus. It's not easy. And sometimes we feel like, I don't wanna pray for them anymore. I'm tired, I'm weary. I don't know if I can keep praying. We get so tired and it's not easy to do it. And that's why, again, we go back to it. Let's, we have to do it together. You know, if you can't pray for your kids anymore, I will. If you can't pray for the miracle in your life anymore, I will. If I can't pray for the miracle in my life, you will. I know there's so many moments where we feel like, like God, where are you? I think it's a, we all have moments like that where it's tough, like really tough. And you know how hard it is when you're by yourself in those moments? It's even harder. And you know, some of us were so ashamed of where we are that we're not willing to share the burden with somebody else. And the reality is that's what the church is for. Share the burden. Because life isn't always easy. We have to fight to rebuild. Because we build and we fight at the exact same time and healing might come at a cost. It might come with a fight. A fight to forgive. A fight to let go of the way things used to be. A fight through anxiety and depression. A fight through exhaustion. A fight when we don't see the fruit. When we don't see the success. When we don't see our kids turn their life around. It's a fight. A fight when the people we love the most turn away from Jesus or hurt us in a deep and profound way. I think sometimes when we look around, it feels like sometimes that the church is struggling, like globally. I think sometimes it feels like, like it's this constant battle. We hear statistics of people leaving the church. People are so desperately hurt by the church that they, that they leave and they give up. They don't come back. And I think what, what I think happened is that for some of us, we've become so passive in our faith. So passive in our walk with Jesus. We have him there, we give, we serve. But once we leave on Sunday, we leave our hammer and we leave our sword on our seat. We only build and fight on Sunday and then we go home and the rest of the week, it's just normal life. We stop building our relationship with him. The only time we, we hear about Jesus, the only time we sing about him is Sunday for 20, 30 minutes. 
You know, it's not going to make a difference anyways. The battle's too long. I'm tired. The fight is hard. We can't be passive with our faith. And I love sports, as you, you probably know, and football is by far my favorite sport. And again, I played in high school. I thought I was going to go play in the NFL. Like, I, like to be honest, like, I, I could be a millionaire right now, but I chose Jesus instead. <laughs> now, I'm going to be honest. Every time I watch football, there's a part of me that's like, I still got it. You know what I mean? I'm like, I got it. And then, like, I walk up my stairs, and I'm out of breath. I'm like, I don't got it. You know, I, I like, go work out. I'm like, yeah. Good thing I retired at 18, you know. There's a difference between me sitting on my couch with my Doritos watching the game than those who actually play in the game. But I think sometimes as believers, you know what we do? We're spectators rather than participants. We're spectating what God is doing rather than being a participant in what God is doing. How many times do we miss out on what God is leading us to? Why? Because I just like to watch it. And now I'm, not, I'm not saying there's not moments to watch what God's doing. It's amazing. But eventually we got to get into the game. Eventually, we got to take our role and take our, our, our job back of fighting and building at the same time. We can't live our life or live, our, live out our faith as spectators. I don't think we're supposed to be spectators. I think we're supposed to be in the game. We're supposed to be the ones holding the hammer, holding the sword, fully trusting that God has us. We gotta get out of the rafters and we gotta get into the game. And as we mature spiritually, we transition from spectator to participant. It might be time for us to start participating a little bit more with what God is doing in our nation, in, in our church, and across the world. If we continue in the story, this is a couple chapters later in Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 15 to 16. It's super powerful. Read this. So the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month of Elul in 52 days. Now those of us who work in construction, we know 52 days to finish a project is a miracle. Might, the project might not even start for 52 days. Because you don't got the right screws. Some guy slept in. Now they have to put the whole project off. 52 days they completed this wall. And when all our enemies heard this, we got to hear this part. And when all our enemies heard of it, all the nations around us were afraid and fell greatly in their own esteem. For they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. Whew. Do you know what's so funny about this? Their enemies were afraid. Why? Because they built a wall around their city. They didn't conquer anything. They didn't go to battle. They defended themselves while they built, but they didn't go to battle. Yet their enemies are terrified about the wall. Because what they did was impossible. The last thought I have today is that our victory intimidates the enemy. Remember, we got to remember that the enemy is shaking in his boots because of the parts of you he thought he had destroyed are being rebuilt. The parts of your life he thought he had control over, he's lost. The relationships that he thought he had divided are now unified. The Savior he thought that he had crucified has come back to life. We've won the battle. Our victory intimidates the enemy. When we build, it's intimidating. This is why there's so much power in story and testimony. This is why we share our story. This is why we share what Jesus has done in our life. This is why we celebrate. It builds up. It builds our faith. It builds our joy. It builds our hope. He encourages us. And we have courage because God puts courage in us. Sometimes a small victory can put enough courage into us to get us to the next one. 
And I'm telling you, if someone comes to you and they're excited about something that you think is not a big deal, celebrate with them. Can't tell me, like I worked student ministry for so long and some kids would come up to me like, I didn't fail high school. And I'm like, I'm so proud of you. You know, and I had moments where in my own life, I would share a small victory, something small, like, you know, I passed my test. And people were like, oh, I'm so proud of you. Good job. And, to, like, to be honest, like, it wasn't like this massive victory. But sometimes we need the small victories in order for us to get the big victories. Sometimes the biggest thing to overcome addiction in your life, the small victory, might, might be actually opening your mouth and talking to somebody about it. Sometimes it's the hardest thing to do when it comes to healing is to admit you have a problem. Because what happens is that we build excitement from small victory to victory to victory to victory. And we keep on going. And I've had this stirring in my heart as we head into this fall and as we head into this new year that something is happening. I have this feeling and this stirring inside of me Something is shaking. Something is different as we head into this fall. Now, I wish I knew what that was. But I'm feeling this way about our church, but across the, the world, but specifically talking about our church, that God is building our church. He's bringing in fresh life and fresh fruit and new vision and new life and new love and I have this feeling inside of me that something is shifting. And I believe that he's calling you and I to be a part of it. So the big question I, I want to hopefully answer for us today quickly is how do we partner in building his church? How do we do this? And I want this to be as simple as possible. How do we partner in building his church on earth, building our church? Number one, show hospitality. Say hi to one another. And the Bible says to greet each other with a holy kiss. I'm not expecting that though. Okay, like culturally it might be a little different. I don't know. But be warm and welcoming to each other when we come on Sunday. Say hi. Come early and have a coffee with somebody. Sit with somebody new. Some of us were so scared to sit somewhere new. It's like, I got my seat and like, I ain't moving. Someone tries to take your seat. You're like, I'm pulling out my sword right now, right? Maybe sit with somebody new. Maybe show hospitality to, another, to each other. You know, we exist. Our, our, our mission, this is our vision, is to make Jesus known to be a place that anyone calls home. How do you treat people when they come into your own home? It's the same here. Treat each other well. Number two is serve. See, the church isn't built by one person. It's all of us serving each other. It's all of us coming together to serve one another. And that's serving in our church, and we have so many areas in our church that we're looking for people to come and serve in. But it's also just serving each other outside of a Sunday. Bringing meals to each other or hanging out or having a phone call asking for prayer like, like serve each other number three is pray for your pastors you know Beth and I we need your prayers I think sometimes and I, like, I don't know I hope you're praying for me I pray you're praying for me um, but sometimes we're like oh no I, like, you, as pastors like sometimes we're the last people that you think about praying for sometimes that's the way it is and I'm not like saying why do you do that? I'm, that's just, because in my own, when I was in my church and I had my pastor, he wasn't the person I was praying for. And Pastor Paul Just, he's our overseer of all our victory churches in, uh, in the north, says this, you get the pastor you pray for. Pray for us. We need your prayers. Number four is connect outside a, of a Sunday morning. Connect not just Sunday, Monday. That's another day of the week. Even Tuesday. Jane's learning her days of the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I still got it. 
I was joking. It's like, it's like, that's my small victory for the day. You know, I still know my days. <laughs> Don't get me on months, though, okay? Don't get me on months. I'm joking. But connect with each other outside of a Sunday morning. Invite someone over for supper or go for a walk. Even today, invite someone out for lunch to come to your own house and have a meal together. You know, get connected in one of uh, the, the, the known groups we started. We have prayer happening every Wednesday morning at 6 a.m. We did it this past Wednesday. It was amazing. It was early, but it was amazing. You know, Wednesday was my, one of my favorite days of the week. Why? Because I started it out with people I love and praying together. I want to encourage you to come out Wednesday morning at 6. It's early, yeah. Come anyway. You know, we have a, a known group on Thursday nights at Mike and Kayla's house. With some worship and prayer and a study on the book of John. Go and be part of that. We have a potluck happening. The first Sunday of every month, but I believe it's happening September 24th this month. Yeah. The week before October 1st, September 24th. Yeah. Go to that. Why we're not doing it on the October 1st is because we have our 30th anniversary, okay? But the 24th, go be a part of a, a meal, a potluck at someone's home, at somebody's home. Number five is give. Now give to what God is doing in our church and give to what God is doing across the world. You know, don't let just giving to the church be your only place of generosity. Be generous at home and at work and with your employees, with your bosses and with your kids. Be generous. Number six is invite. The church isn't just for you and for me. It's for all of us. And we can see the gospel go farther the more people we share the gospel with. And I don't mean just inviting to church. Yes, invite people to church, but invite people into a relationship with Jesus as well. Share Jesus with people. So Nehemiah, he saw the need, he saw the wall was broken, he prayed about it. What do I do? He realized his calling through prayer and brought people with him and rebuilt the wall. If you want to look for purpose in your life, see what the need is, pray about it, understand your call to it, bring people with you, and make it happen. It's like that's such a small way to say it. But see, our purpose is often found in the pain around us. We can't run away from pain. In fact, I think we're supposed to pursue pain and bring Jesus into it to bring healing. Jesus is leading us. Jesus is rebuilding with us. And I love that I get to serve a God that leads us and serves us. If we want to build a church that the gates of hell will not prevail, we got to do it together with him. Sword in hand, hammer in hand, ready to fight, ready to protect, ready to build. Let's rebuild together. Let's build his church together. Let's fight for our city and fight for our families and fight for our community. Let's build his kingdom here on earth. And our takeaway today is this, is rebuilding requires collaboration. Coming together to build together. That's what it takes. So God, I pray that today Help us put away any pride holding us back, any shame holding us back from seeking help and seeking community. God, help us learn to be honest and real. And I pray that Known Victory Church will be a place that anyone can call home. Where they come in, they feel like they're part of our family, part of our community, that they're welcomed with open arms. And God, I pray for all of us today. God, I pray specifically even for me that I won't just spectate, but I'll be a participant. I won't just spectate and watch what you're doing. God, help me be a part of what you're doing. To participate. To keep on going. Help all of us be participants in the gospel, not just spectators. And God, I pray that you help us, all of us, continue more important than anything 
to draw closer to you. And everything we do, God, help us draw closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen.